two, one. Yeah, there we go. We are now live. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to give it just a couple of moments to see who comes into the chat room. And yes, we are definitely live. And let me go ahead and make a quick shout out, Dawood. I'm going to make a quick shout out on Facebook. So let's see, join the live conversation. And we're going to see who comes on into the chat room. I'm going to share that on my page. So you just posted it. Okay, I'm about to. I'm a, I'm gonna tag you in it. Okay. And let's see. And then you can share it if you need to. Yeah. Okay. So I just shared it with you right now. Okay. And uh, we're getting some people coming into the chat room now. And uh, all right, so welcome everyone, welcome. I am so, so very excited for my guests I have on today. And before we get started, as usual, I like to bring out the chimes, bring out the chimes and invite everyone into this sacred space. So let's take a nice, deep, centering breath and enter into this space. So welcome, welcome, welcome. As you can see from the big old smile I have on my face, I am excited about this evening. And today we have with us, and I got to make sure I pronounce this last name right, we have Emmy Award winning illustrator, Dawood Anya Bueli. How did I do on the pronunciation, Dawood? Pretty good, pretty good. Anya, Anya Buile. Anya Buile. Yes, mm -hmm. I know. You you schooled me on that years ago. Anya Buile. There we go. Sometimes well, you gotta do it more than once. I'm sorry? Sometimes you just gotta do it more than once. Yeah, there we go. Anya Buile is such a beautiful name. Can you tell me what that means? Anya Buile. It's uh it's from Nyakusa, Tanzania. And it means God has unchained me. God has unchained me. Okay, cool. So I received a press release today, and this is what prompted me to say, hey, you know what? We should go ahead and time this conversation with the press release. So let me share this press release. For immediate release, January 3rd, 2018, Brother Man Comics included in Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Big City Entertainment announces the inclusion of artwork and memorabilia from the Brother Man comic series into the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, located in Washington, DC. The historical and unique materials are to be included in its archive collection for use in research and exhibition. And let me read on down a little bit further. The critically acclaimed and award-winning Brother Man Dictator of Research Discipline Comic Book Series was created and published by brothers Dawood Anyabwile, Guy A. Simmons, and Sims and Jason Sims in 1990 under the banner of the now defunct Big City Comics Inc. In 2007, Dawood formed Big City Entertainment Inc., a multimedia and publishing company with Guy A. Sims as head writer. Brother Man is a continuing story of a man drawn deeper into the darkness to bring light to those who have lost all hope. Beyond the art and storylines, the impact of Brother Man has and continues to be the creative catalyst for people of all backgrounds, ethnicities, nationalities. Brother Man is noted as a major catalyst for the modern day black comic book movement. Dawood, 
from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is an Emmy award-winning artist, illustrator, and entrepreneur. He has shared his artistic talents with major, with major companies such as Cartoon Network, Turner Studios, NBA TV, Harper Collins Publishing, and Scholastic recipient of numerous awards, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the East Coast Black Age of Comics Convention, Glyph Comics Award for Best Artist, the Key to Kansas City for Outstanding Service to Children, nominated for the Will Eisner Award, Best Artist at the San Diego Comic Con 1992. And we have him with us today. So Dawood, why don't you go ahead and tell us a, a little more about yourself, uh, your background and you know the journey that brought you into Brother Man. Um, well, I'm trying to think where to, where to start because it, it's really like a, a, it's a lifetime journey. It wasn't one of those, uh, spur of the moment, hey, I got an idea, you know, let's come up with a, uh, you know, a sneaker with propellers on it, you know, something you just thought of and there's really no history to it. But with Brother Man, uh, that's kind of the culmination of a, a lifetime of development that was cultivated in our home growing up in Philly. And I, I'm, I'm the youngest of four brothers, four boys. Um, the oldest passed away in 2010. That was my brother, Michael. Then I have a brother, Guy, who's actually the, the writer, the head writer of the Brother Man comic series and co-creator. I have another brother, Jason, who served as the production manager of the book. And when we were growing up, actually, Jason and I used to do like animated movies, like 3D animated movies where we build, oh, I should have grabbed this in the next room. I still have like the, the um, what do you call it? The armature. You know what? If you want to go ahead and grab it, go right ahead and I'll show your website and I'll put, yeah, cool. I'll put on screen presentation for Brother Man website. I'll do that for everyone. That would be cool. All right, so let me go ahead and bring this on up while he gets that okay so screen share present to everyone so this is the brother man revolution and uh let's see let me close all of this down there so there we go so this is the website which is brothermancomics.com Brother Man Comics included in Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture which we all know is American history. And there we go, there's the Smithsonian and a uh, couple of covers from the comic. And uh, there we go. Scroll on down there. Let's let me know when you're back. Oh yeah, I'm here. Okay, and so here's a storyboarding for television and film master class that took place in September. Is that not awesome? And by the way, uh, Dawood was an illustrator for the beloved, one of the illustrators for the beloved Rugrats. So many of you might be familiar with Rugrats. So there we go. Wild Thornberries. Oh, yes, yes, I knew there was another one. Yeah, that was the primary show that I was on. Oh, cool, I love that show, yeah, I remember when we were talking and you told me about that show. Okay, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. So <laughs> Wild Thornberries. Now was that just a series or did you work on the movie as well? Now actually I left LA right right before the movie started. Uh-huh. Um, and that was a whole nother chapter in my life, why I left LA. Uh-huh, okay. Uh, that, that was like, you know how we were talking about uh, personal, like your spiritual journey, and your spiritual right. quest. That was part of the reason why I left LA. I mean, LA was cool on certain levels. You know, every place has its pros and cons. Right. And so I'm never down on a place that I lived there. I gained a lot of great things from working in New York, working in LA, working in Atlanta, mm -hmm. being from Philly. I was in Dallas 
for like four years, and each each place I lived at served, uh, you know, served a purpose. Right, right. And one reason why I walked away from Hollywood mm -hmm. is because, and it wasn't the job. The job was great. That was like one of my. That was the reason why I went to LA because I said I want to get the I want to get the experience. I don't know what it's like to work at a Hollywood production studio. But you know what, Double? Before we get there, let's start from back in your childhood and when you did stuff with your brothers. And I know you just got an answer yeah. you just said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is what I was talking about. This little character here. Awesome. Now, can you believe that my brother Jason, he built this in 19, I think it was like 1979 or 19, no, probably 1980. Wow. And this is an armature. This is like, so we were like 14, 15 years old. And, you know, you figure back then you don't have like YouTube and you don't have all these online tutorials. You know, we had to go down to this place called the library <laughs> and all these books and stuff. And the card catalog, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to ask the librarian and she tell you, be quiet. <laughs> well, I'm trying to ask you a question. So, <laughs> so um, but now we had to go find, you know, find out how do you make this stuff. And, and also there were these magazines that they used to sell called um, uh, Fantastic, was it Films Magazine? Uh, what was that other one? Uh, Fangoria. And oh, they were like, yeah, I remember that magazine. Yeah, they're like monster magazines and stuff like that. And, and, you thing, mentioned, and, and uh, Dawood, you mentioned one magazine before Fangoria, but it kind of cut out. Can you mention that one again? Oh, fan, Fantastic Films. So you see this? Uh-huh. <laughs> so this was, like in the back, they, you know, they tell you these little, you know, little tricks of the trade, you know, how you can make somebody like transport, like on Star Trek. You know, like how we will go out back and, and and we'll act like we're getting beamed up to a spaceship or something, and you know, so you got to film somebody, then you got to jump out the way and film the background, and then you got to superimpose with bleach and all this stuff, and then you know, but it didn't have any sound back then. But just seeing it, the special effect back then was blowing our minds. You know what I'm saying? So, and then for kids on the block, nobody was really doing that back then, not not in our neighborhood. So we we're kind of like leading the way and learning at the same time. My oldest brother, Michael, was the one who started uh, the whole animation thing when I was in kindergarten. And I don't know how he figured it out. He used to do like, like whole animated movies in our basement, like space movies and stuff. That was sort of like on the uh, South Park tip where he'll, he'll cut out these characters and every little thing, the eyeball, the mouth and everything, and he'll he had all these eyes, all these mouths, and he'll change the eye, change the mouth, and then we get the final animation. The characters are talking from him moving it around. I remember like, yo, man, how, how you know how to do this stuff? But he he then went into uh, mathematics and, and science. He was uh, very left brain, even though he is creative. He went the left brain route, and he ended up becoming a mechanical engineer um, in L.A. for uh, Northrop. And he, and at one point, I think he was like studying to be a, an astronaut. You know, he's jumping out of planes and climbing mountains. I mean, he did all kinds of adventurous type stuff. And so that was my oldest brother, Michael. Guy was always the writer. You know, he didn't draw. And I mean, he's a seasoned writer. Like some people, they'll, they'll, they know Guy writes Brother Man and they, they think of him like, hey, you write, you write comic books? Now he doesn't write comic books, he writes. He can write a comic book, he can write a novel, he can write plays, screenplays, he can write a drama, he can write a comedy, he can write poetry. You know, he can pull all different emotions from you. He's always been skilled like that since he was young. And I remember the kids on the block used to call him Sir Wordsworth because guy, he was always hitting the kids with all these big words and could be like, man, what's that mean? He was always sending us to the dictionary since we were kids. Kids on the block, on the corner, he'll have them going to the dictionary, like, man, what'd you just say? <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious, you know? So when we did Brother Man, it was kind of like he was, he was flipping all those skill sets from like the 70s and the 80s, the stuff we used to just do in the neighborhood. And now we're, we're manufacturing it and flipping it into a, 
uh, a mythology and putting that back out into the to the world. So so our house growing up, you know, we were always doing creative things and things that were kind of out of the box. Uh, my mom was a, a Philadelphia public school teacher before she passed and she played the piano. We had a baby grand piano in the house that my dad bought for her. She's from Jersey City, New Jersey. My dad's from Jersey City, New Jersey, but they left Jersey City, went to Boston and then moved to uh, West Philly and then ended up in Northwest Philly where me and my brothers grew up. And, and so family was always encouraged. Family was a big component. My father wrote books on the black family. He wrote ceremonies that are still being practiced in facilities and community centers and churches all, all over the country, um, these programs and ceremonies that he wrote. Oh, wow. Can you tell us your, your mother and your father's name, if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah. my father's name is Dr. Edward Sims Jr. And he is very well known like among uh, his peers. When we were growing up, I remember watching him, you know, just do interviews on television and Mm -hmm. yeah, talking about the, the black community and things going on and how to how to um, you know just right the wrongs that are going on in our community and, and creating safe space for you know kids like us you know we were growing up and, you know he created safe space for us you know he grew up hard in Jersey City and he didn't want that for us so we didn't know you know that wasn't my life my life was fun you know animation you know creating models and drawing and uh just acting silly and you know that that's the environment that they created for us you know my mom she was always playing the piano so music filled the house as well so um i always equated music with art and because my mom is the one who taught me the connection between uh music the visual and the 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 audio so she would buy me um well, actually, she, she, actually, she didn't buy me records. She had records, and we would sit down and listen to the records, and she would ask me what I see. Oh, know, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, like, there was a record called Ebb Tide, um, which, you know, it's like orchestra music, because my mom was really big on, like, orchestra, uh, classical music, um, jazz, uh, you know, there was all kinds of stuff in our house. Classic soul was the big thing in our house. But the, the theatrical music and stuff, that came out of the classical, the appreciation for classical music, you know, Tchaikovsky, Chopin, all that, you know, Beethoven, all that stuff. Um, and I remember how she would say, hey, what do you see when you listen to this? So as a little kid, I remember laying under, some of the best times for me was laying under the piano while my mom played. And I would listen to her trying to get like, she'll be playing these uh, uh, these songs, and I always think of like her fingernails clicking the ivory, and trying to get the note right. And she'll go back and play that same chord and play the same chord over and over and over till she get it right. And I, I always be like, wow, she's good, you know. And I'm soaking this in as a little kid because she used to bring me home stacks of drawing paper since she was a public school teacher in North Philly, she'd bring me home a, like stacks of, of paper. And I, I was just like, man, this is gold. Cause all I wanted to do was draw as a kid. Forget sports and all that stuff. You know, I was, I didn't care about that. I just wanted to draw. So when she brought me home that paper, I mean, I never wanted to come out of my room or I would lay up under the piano cause the piano was so huge since I was small. And it was like a little shelter. It was like a creative shelter. And I could just sit there all day and just come up with all these crazy ideas. You know, spaceships, monsters, helicopters, sharks. You know, and that, that's how I used to be, you know, growing up. That was my thing. And so, but at the same time, like I said, my father was big on um, history. Like our, our basement was like a, uh, what do you call it? Like a, a black history library. So when you go in the, the basement, you know, it was big pictures of Malcolm X, posters that my dad had, like, I am the black child. I remember that poster with a little black boy. Um, and then just looking on the bookshelf, he had all different types of, of books and 
someone like uh, the move. There was a, one book in particular called The Movement that was about the lynchings and civil rights movement. And I remember just sitting down in the basement by myself and just looking at like lynchings, pictures of lynchings and um, and then looking at the greatness of us, you know, before being enslaved and just wondering, like, going through those moments of like, man, like, what happened? Like, why am I, why am I not living this life? Why, why are we living like this? How come I'm not living in this greatness? What happened? You know, and so just as a child, I used to, I used, my mind used to really go in that direction of trying to figure out why are we like this? Why is our communities like this? I used to just hate the negativity in our communities and used to be like, man, can I do something about it? And I used to feel so small, like, man, I can't, what can I do? I'm just some kid with a pencil. I don't have power. That's how I used to think for a long time. I didn't, I didn't really come into the understanding of my power till my early twenties when I started airbrushing at the mall. Oh, right on, right on. See what I'm saying? That's why I'm saying it's a journey because that's what led to me recognizing my power in my 20s and then recognizing that power flipped into doing the comic book where it's like, I know I got power. I just need to put it in a $2 book and mass produce it. So it wasn't about I'm doing this because I love comics. I'm doing this because comics are easy to print and you can get your, you can, you can proliferate a concept to the world for a couple thousand dollars. You know, it's not like you got to, you don't have to have a, a, a film production team. You just sit down and draw a book. The first Brother Man book I did it in two months. It was out by the third month. We introduced it at the Black Expo in New York. The book took off. And I remember reporters asking us, like, yeah, you know, thinking it was a fluke. Like, did you know your book was going to do this? And I said, yeah, I knew it was going to do that. And they, they think you're arrogant when you say And I said, no. Because, I said, I know because this is what I prepped myself for. They don't realize all throughout the 80s, and I didn't talk about that when I was airbrushing. And I'm probably jumping around so you can always grab me and reel me back in if I skip something. But the 80s, when I when I first air, started airbrushing shirts after high school, um, and I've always had a self, uh, I always had a spirit of entrepreneurship. I never wanted to work for anybody. Right on, right on. Yeah, that 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 came from my my dad. He was always like, he's always like, you know. He didn't, he didn't groom us to like have a talent and go out there and give your talent to somebody. He always said, harness your talent and you know, do your best to, to keep it or maintain it, control it. Uh, your, your, your talent should benefit your people and your community. So that was in my mind since I was young. You know? and, and I always said, man, I ain't working for nobody. I think I put that in my, my yearbook, in my senior yearbook, that I was going to be an entrepreneur. So when I was 19, uh, there was at the Gallery Mall, which was, it's not there anymore in Philly, but it used to be the largest mall, I think, on the East Coast throughout the 80s. I mean, even Fresh Prince talks about being at the Gallery Mall and all his records. Everybody went to the gallery. And uh, so I went down there with my boy, uh, one of, my boy Kelly, and I had a, I had just learned how to airbrush by a friend of mine uh, in Jersey when I was at Rutgers for a year. I was at Rutgers in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and a friend of mine, he just, he had an airbrush, and I didn't even know what an airbrush was, because airbrushing was not, it's not the, it wasn't the phenomenon that it is now. I mean, you, we're talking 1983, 84. That's when hip-hop was really just, like, blossoming. You know what I mean? Like, you got Run DMC hitting the scene, Rakim. I think Rakim even came out, like, after that, uh, like, 85. So, it, you're talking about another era where, you know, people didn't really see, other than like graffiti on the walls, reason why graffiti was like so hyped to us in terms of the characters is because we're seeing black characters or cool characters, but they were always on the walls. I couldn't go somewhere and buy them right. and, you know, wear them or something. So I said, man, if I take that, put that on a shirt, that'd be dope. So that's how that started. So my friend, he showed me how, he just showed me how to hold the airbrush. He was from Teaneck, New Jersey. My boy Daryl Jones. So he said, he said, uh, he just showed me how to hold the airbrush, and he said, "See, man, you got this, boom, boom, boom." And I was like, "Oh, that's so tight." <laughs> so it was like it was like a whole new world. It was like it's like somebody showing you, like opening the door to a whole new um, 
existence. I said, nobody's doing this. So I transferred back to Philly to uh, Tyler School of Art, Temple University. And I didn't finish school anyway back then. I ain't gonna lie. And, and I'm not ashamed of it because I just felt like I was wasting my time, especially back then. I spent all this money and I said, man, I learned more stuff on my own than what they're trying to teach me here. Uh, and during that time, and that's my experience. I don't tell other people don't go. That was just my experience. And, um, and plus, I was like one of the only brothers there. I just didn't feel, I didn't feel like part of the, 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 the decor. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, so I, we went down to the gallery mall, a friend of mine, Kelly, and he was good at talking. And I was, you know, I, I was kind of like bad come up on stuff. And there was a brother that ran this this uh, t-shirt shop called Wild Tops. And everybody would go down to Wild Tops and you get the heat press shirts. Matter of fact, I got a heat press right back there now. Oh yeah, I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I, so right there back when like, you know, the B-boys and B-girls go down there and they get their name. And like, it was always like, oh, uh, you know, cool such and such, Tony B something, whatever. And, or a picture of a, a cat or, uh, you know, like a Warner Brothers character. But there was, you couldn't really get you on a shirt. So I told the dude, we said, hey, man, you want to make a million dollars? Let me set up in here now and, and let me airbrush a shirt. And he said, what's that? And I, sh I held up a shirt that I did. And he said, hmm, how many, how many of these shirts can you do in a day? That was, the, that was the one and only shirt I ever did. I don't know how, but I ain't going to tell him that. I said, um. Uh, and I said, I'm probably like 10. And he said, all right, why don't you set up next week? I'll give you the spot down, downstairs in the, uh, right at the courtyard. So he was set me up right where the hub, right where everybody comes into that mall, right off this Broad Street line. That's the subway line and the, the, the Market Frankfurt elevated train line. Everybody converges and comes into the gallery. And I was like, yo, I'm going to have so many eyes on me. And, and you know what? I didn't even own an airbrush or <laughs> I didn't have an airbrush or a compressor. Like that's what you need to run it. I didn't have any paints. I was, remember I did that one shirt when I was at Rutgers when my friend let me hold it, let me use his equipment. And I think it took me three hours to do one shirt. I wasn't even masterful at it. So I went to my dad and I said, dad, um, hey, if you give me like $150, I get this, I can get this airbrush. And uh, and I'll, I'll pay you back. And he said, he said, OK, I'll, I'll lend you the money. So he lent me the money. I got the airbrush in a month. No, I paid him back. I think within two weeks, I made so much money. I mean, I wasn't Russell Simmons rich, nothing like that. But I'm just saying for a kid who's 19 years old, never did this stuff before. And I'm free. I'm, I'm like independent. It was like I, I did thousands of shirts. I remember one time just looking at the receipts from one summer. And I said, I did over, like, I think over 500 shirts in a summer. I said, that's a lot, that's a lot of shirts. And that was just in the beginning. So that was the, the entrepreneurial aspect. But what also came with me doing that was dealing with the general public and finding out who I was. Not to say I completely understood who I was. There's still journeys to that. But I did learn a lot about who I was um in dealing with my peers because a lot of graffiti writers that's why i met a lot of the graffiti writers I and mean, i'm talking about i'm talking about like philly's most wanted dudes bombing all over the city you know their names is everywhere they they have this thing called you know uh if you if you tag up hit up put your name your name is seen everywhere you go down the block it's on like building after building after telephone pole after the mailbox they even hit up on trees and you just see the name going all the way down. That's called a rally. So when, when you see somebody just going all the way down the street, all the way down the block, into the next neighborhood, take the train and the bus, and you're still seeing. <laughs> so these, these were like the guys who were starting to come down, and, and a lot of them would challenge me. You know, all of them wasn't friendly. Some, some were like really cool, come down, yo, man, yo, yo, let me see what you're doing. You know, I'm like 20, 19, 20, and these guys come from all over the city. And some of them into stuff I'm not into. I told you, you see how I came up. I'm not living that life that some of these dudes are living. But one thing we had in common, we all like to draw. And we all like to see ourselves. 
that's what I noticed. The reason why I was cool with a lot of these dudes is because I knew how to draw us. I knew how to draw them. I said, you come up, man, I'll draw you the way you look, doing what you do. And I'll bang it out on a shirt real fast because really what I was doing was gesture drawings. That's what I learned in high school. But I had my own spin to it, and I had the kids wearing what we were wearing back then, you know, sheepskin coats, uh, bombers, and um, uh, rabbit fur hats, gazelle frames. But I was really blowing out the characters. I knew how to get the poses and the positions. Because my, my art teacher, he taught me that. He taught me how to see, you know, just how I'm sitting in the chair now. Sometimes kids, when they draw, they draw characters all stiff because they didn't learn about gesture and motion and how to force the perspective. I learned all that in high school and I got really good at it. So I was visioning, envisioning things that a lot of kids weren't doing. I see it all the time now and a lot of dudes, they, they, um, they credit me for really bringing that style to the forefront. I mean, this is before Boondocks, all this stuff was coming out. And right. you, know, you, know, you know, I respect all that stuff, but you know, I'm just talking. Okay. I would. I want to ask you a question. You know, you just you talked about how you were able to visualize. Do you think that your mother having you listen to the music and then telling her what you saw when you listened to the music kind of had something to do with being able to visualize so well? My, my mom and dad had a lot to do with my mom, my dad and my brothers had a lot to do with how I handled these dudes downtown. Because what happens is, I can, matter of fact, I'm writing a book on this because there's so much to say. And, and a lot of this, I feel like it's not said out here, like in the ethers. Like when I watch like panel discussions and stuff like that, I said, nobody really talks about this component. Even when we talk about like troubled youth or troubled boys and stuff like that, I said, I don't think y'all really listen to like what, 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 it's causing some of these troubles. Right, right. And, you know, because I dealt with dudes, they was coming up doing all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when we had our store in North Philly. I had, you know, after the gallery, I opened up my own shop there. And, uh, and you know, you had a lot of dudes coming in, they were drug dealing and stuff like that. You know, I, I'm not one that, I can't tell them what they should do. I mean, I knew this is the things that they're doing, but I looked at it like, hey, this is a family store. Hey, you come in the store, you know, I, if I know you, you got not to, you got a knot of money in your pocket. I'm not trying to get that knot of money in your pocket just because I know you got it. It's still $30. It's $30 for you and it's $30 for her. $30 for that little kid is $30 for grandpa. You see what I'm saying? Right. When sometimes some people, they try to hit them up because they feel like, yo, they got more money. And so you're kind of like trying to, and then they feel like you, you're scamming them. You're trying to get my money. Cause you know I got money. Cause really, my thing I'm just looking at like people for who they are. Yo, this is what this is what I do. This is what it costs. Blah blah blah. I'm not. Right. Happy. But what well, I, I guess you know what I guess what I was trying to bring out that maybe the music, listening to the music and kind of contemplating the music. Because I'll give you an example. I remember several years ago there was a, a concert by Philip Glass. Are you familiar with Philip Glass? I heard that name before. Yeah, he's a pianist. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we had a concert here in town because the uh, James Carroll, who runs the new art program, would bring Philip Glass in like every three years. So one year I went to the concert and I'm sitting there and he's he composes like poetry on the piano and he's playing it. And I closed my eyes because that's the way I like to listen to that type of music. And I literally, as he was playing, I began to see all of these shapes and movements in my mind's eye. It's like I saw artwork that went along with the painting, so I'm uh, playing on the piano. So I'm wondering if your mother playing the piano constantly while you're reading or while you're drawing, do you think that played a big part and you're able, your ability to conceptualize what others did. And because, you know, as you mentioned, we wouldn't have boondocks, you know, sort of born out of the style of that graffiti comics that you brought to life. Yeah, well, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, I guess when I was talking about the other thing, I'm, I'm kind of like deviating from one to the other, but they're, they're all interrelated. Right. And yeah. um, because what I was trying to get at with, with what I was saying with dealing with these dudes and how that related to my family, 
was things that my dad taught me and my mom. So my mom, she kind of brought a sensitivity to it. It's like, basically, I guess, you know, because I, I do know I have my a, a sensitive side. I had a dude one time said, man, you you sensitive, huh? And I said, what's the opposite? What's the opposite of that? Insensitive? So what are you, insensitive? I said, so if I'm sensitive and you're not, that means you're insensitive, which means you don't care about anything but yourself. Because insensitive means I don't care about a child. I don't care about this woman. I don't care about the elders. You got to have sense. Sensitivity just means, yeah, I care about things. You know, I mean, if you flip it to make it seem like, you know, that means homosexuality or whatever, you know, a lot of dudes have this this uh, homophobic thing where they, they got to be like rah, rah, 24-7. But you still have to tap into an element of caring. Even a warrior has sensitivity because they're defending a nation. So they have to be sensitive to the people in their, 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 their that they're protecting, and then they're aggressive toward those they're trying to uh, uh, defeat. You see what I'm saying? So, um, and I was saying all that to say that my mom, she she gave me that aspect, and then my dad gave me more of the, the attack mode. And my attack mode was just rooted in my art, because my art was my attack mode. You know, I, I wasn't... You know, Muhammad Ali wasn't my dad, so I wasn't the boxer. That wasn't the main thing I learned. It was it was drawing. And then I realized the drawing was a tool. So the things that my mom taught me in terms of like listening to the music, it made me see. And we listened, like I said, we listened to a lot of classic soul. So when you think of like and, and Philadelphia is that city anyway, it's the, it's the city of soul. So when you're growing up and you're listening to the songs that are always talking about, I mean, just the, the melody and the way they feel, it, it just feels peaceful. It feels like, uh, you know, listen to WDAS, you know, you're just always listening to something like, let me put love on your mind and, uh, and songs like Enchantment and, uh, um, oh man, there's, there's so many, Black Butterfly, you know, you, you Things like that in your mind, I'm visualizing what these songs are talking about, you know, and it's like that started to become adept and become part of my work. So when I'm meeting these 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 dudes downtown, and and what I learned also from my dad is like what what happens with a lot of us men and particularly black men. You know, a lot of us are like that crab in the barrel. Like, you know, we, we fighting over scraps. So, you know, they come downtown, they see me airbrushing and doing something and I'm getting a little change. You know, some of them, they can't just congratulate you. They gotta be like, they gotta challenge you. They can't just walk up and say something nice. They gotta come up and first thing out their mouth is they wanna challenge me. But the thing is, I understand it. So I don't, I don't, I don't return. I didn't give them the, 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 the pleasure of returning the, confrontation with confrontation because I was confident in myself that no matter what name they call me or whatever I knew that wasn't me I like I'm not that you know I don't have to tell them I'm not that I know I'm not that and what you're just telling me is that you're confused you're sad and I and, I, and to me that's not funny it's like this is sad like dude don't even know how to communicate with me there's something going on in his life so I always respected that, even though I don't know these cats. Cause I remember this one guy, and this is, this is, these are the reasons why I'm saying how I kind of learned my powers. Cause these are superpowers. Right. I just, this, my cousin, she came down from Jersey City to help me. She was like my little sister. And she was helping me, uh, you know, she was collecting the money and talking to the customers while I airbrushed the shirts. Uh, my cousin Robin. And <laughs> I just remember these guys came down and they were all like b-boy down with the fat shoelaces and all that stuff. One dude was pointing at my shirt. Man, that's corny. That's corny. That's corny. You know. And um, my cousin, she was saying, "Can you do better? Can you do better?" And I was like, "I said, Robin, relax. I said that's his opinion. He can have his opinion. I mean, if it's corny to him, then I guess it's corny. Because me, I'm like, those shirts are sold. <laughs> I'm already making money." So I said to the dude, I said, hey, I said, uh, so you draw? He's like, yeah. And then uh, I said, so you write? Because I figured you write graffiti, yeah. And I asked him what he wrote. And then I said, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. And then he was like, 
I said, you got any artwork with you? And you got a sketchbook? He said, yeah. And I said, can I see it? And he pulled this book out. And I said, yo, this is pretty good. So I was telling him, you know, I was like, give him some compliments, dapping him up. Like, yo, this is, this is tight right here. And he said, yeah, man, I like to do this, blah, 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 yada, yada. I was like, yo, I see, I see. And I said, well, let me, let me say this, man. I said, like, if, if my stuff does not compare to yours and I'm set up here at the mall, then you should be set up at the mall and I should be buying from you. And he said, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, that's all you had to say from the beginning. You, you didn't have to come at me like that. You could have just said, got to know me. And if you really want to do this, I'll show you how to do it. It's no big deal. It's no science. You can go down buy an airbrush just like I did. They didn't just sell it to me. That's so anybody come there and buy one. So there ain't nothing holding you back. So then next you know, me and that dude, man, cool. You know what I'm saying? Like, after that, they those same guys who come down at the mall and they'll just sit around. We talk. They bring down their sketchbooks. I bring down more stuff. And then we have like little challenges. But they were like friendly challenges. We ain't like dissing each other. Then we go down the, the, the food court, sit there, talk, tag up each other's books, writing in each other's books. And then all that other stuff in terms of how we met, it, it disappears. It's almost like that was history. And to me, those are the things that started to help me to understand like, um, Yo, I used to think I was just a kid with a pencil. I didn't think I, I didn't think I did anything special. You know, I don't, I don't slam dunk the basketball, and I don't, you know, I don't run the, the, you know, the, the uh, touch stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm just in my room, like you see now. It's all quiet. There's no cheerleaders in here saying, "Go, Dalu!" Oh man, yeah, you know, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta push myself and draw. But when my product is done and I put it out, that's when you get the accolades. That's when you get the cheers and all that stuff. So that's my middle name is, is Kamau. So it's Dawood Osaze Kamau when I changed my name. And Kamau means quiet warrior because I do my warrior work in quiet, in silence. But while everybody's sleeping, you know, I'm plotting out like, oh, man, when I put this out, this is going, this is going to make people think. This is going to change things. So... Now, how how okay? Uh, how long ago was it that you changed your name, and what sort of prompted the name change? And before you say that, I just want to let everyone know that you are a 22 year vegan. Yes. So, and is that raw vegan or? No, I, I do raw, but when uh, I cook. I cook me some food. <laughs> but yeah. vegan food, right. Yeah, no, it's all, yeah, it's all vegan. But, um, I mean, I do the raw thing. You know, I, I do raw pies. I mean, you know, my, my, my winner is my almond cream pie. You know, blueberry live pie. I make strawberry pies. Uh, I mean, that's just the pie. I'm, I'm, I also do my salads, and I make my own salad dressing. I never buy salad dressing. That's whack to me. I like, I like making mine from seeds or nutritional yeast. And um, and it just tastes better. You right, know? Of, course, of course. Yeah, you like that. It's like you know, I don't. I don't even see how you can go back and buy any of that bottled stuff. Right. Uh, okay. But I'm, so I'm, enough food. <laughs> no, I'm getting hungry. I know. Okay. So, <laughs> food. so what prompted the name change? Uh, okay. So this that came years later. That came. So when I was talking about with the airbrushing shirts, that was before Brother Man. That was mid mid eighties. Uh, that was the coming of age period for David Sims, which is my previous name, David Jeffrey Allen Sims. And after we did Brother Man, Brother Man, and the whole success of Brother Man really ran from between 1990 to 1994. Cause my mom died. My mom died the night Brother Man number 10 came out. We introduced number 10 at the Black Expo New York. And that's when we were reaching our apex. That's when we had a quarter of a million books independently outside the comic book industry wow um and and brother man was setting the standard i mean that's that's after arsenio and america's most wanted um major production studios like columbia television all these studios that were coming to us wanting to do a brother man series um all that was happening you know we we're seeing the impact of brother man like all this other stuff was coming out that we could you know i could tell i, I, I could see us influencing dudes come and say hey man you you inspired me. I mean, I'm getting that everywhere. East Coast, West Coast. People from Japan writing me saying you inspired me. 
So this is that's what Brother Man was doing uh, from an independent state. So I felt like you know I was living I was living my dream. I said I'm going to be independent, and I said I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm basically in my twenties. So I felt like I was on that route. So when we were doing the Javits Center in New York, uh, it was a four day event, and my mom died on the the, the night of the first day of the event. So we, we missed out all the rest of those days. We missed Chicago, all the big shows, LA. We missed all out on all of them and then we lost a lot of money. So then um, Brother Man pretty much started to teeter off at that point. Not because it, it never fell off from popularity. It was all internal. It was like, yeah, I can't work, I can't work the same pace like this, you know, because it's not like I work at Turner or Cartoon Network and my mom dies. And Cartoon Network has a institution established where I just go back the next day after I grieve. grieve. You go back and you know, your job's there, it's still there, blah, blah, blah. Hey, this is something that grew out of the family. This is like a brother man. I tell people, when you look at brother man, you're looking at my family photo album. Wow. It's like I'm exposing the family in this. You know, a lot of the family's inspired in the stories, all that stuff. Right, right. Okay, so 1990, you said, was that the first? installation of brotherhood can you take us to that time period like how did you and your brothers get together and say hey let's create brother man i mean okay. what was the genesis what initiated? So you, you want me to do the the name part then go back to that or do that yeah. and work my way up to the name okay so, yeah since yeah. that was after so let's start with the mm -hmm. first comic like how you got to that initiation of the first comic and then on up there all right, well, remember how I was saying, like, okay, so then let's take it back to the mid 80s, but let's wrap it up with that part where I had the, uh, the, the I was doing the custom airbrushing, then the, the, the store at the gallery, they closed down, and then, then I opened up my own shops, first with a couple other guys who were friends of mine. And we had a store in Chester, Pennsylvania, outside of Philly, then we had one in North Philadelphia. And then after that, my brother Jason had moved back from LA because he went to UCLA, so he wasn't really around me in the 80s. And then he came back. Jason's the one who built this, I was telling you about. So yeah. he was studying film and um, communications at UCLA. And then he came back from UCLA. And me and Jason always worked well together, like when it came down to like production, since we always did that. So he saw me on the airbrush thing. And then we said, hey, let's open up an airbrush shop in East Orange, New Jersey, since we had family up there. And my cousin, she owned a weave shop. And, and we would say, hey, we're looking for a store. She said, I know you can get the store right next to us. So, so Big City Comics started right next door to her weave shop. And on the other side is a Chinese food store. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and that's, how we, that's how we started our thing. We, we, it was like a little, you know, little, little store in the community right there outside of Newark, New Jersey. And um, it was kind of like, uh, first we, I was doing the Airbrush shirts, and then the Black Expos had started in 1989. That was a new phenomenon, Black Expo. And they, have, they had all the ads on uh, KISS FM in New York, and we said, yo, this is going to be huge. Let's go there and see what it's all about. So we went in 89, and we went there to see it. I mean, it was just so many people there. And I mean, because this is New York City, so you know people are going to show up. But to see all these black people buying and just like, it was just crazy. We said, man, we got to be there next year. So I was going to be there just airbrushing shirts to get people to come to our store. Like we were thinking to pass out flyers, like comic book flyers, like, you know, just be a one pager that would have a little cartoon on it. And at the end it would say, come to the novelties. That was the name of our first store, Novelties. That's oh. uh, airbrushing shop. Air, custom airbrushing and novelty shop in East Orange, New Jersey, to get that traffic to come across the river in New Jersey. And that was the whole idea. We did a whole plan on it. We had, because we used to do slide presentation graphics. So we used the same equipment to do this presentation of how we can make a comic book. And then I have another friend in Philly named Reggie Byers, who had, he was the only brother I knew who did comic books. And he told me about where to go to get comics printed. Cause back then it's like, it's not like now where you can get millions of places to get printed, especially printing a comic book. You can't just go to like Kinko's or Postal Instant Press. You have to find a specialized comic book printer with a web press and they were hard to find back then. There were only a few in the United States and 
or Canada from what we understood. So we found one in West Virginia, found out how much it costs. Back then you had to print 10,000 books on one run. You couldn't just print a couple books. We had to print 10,000. But we're like, hey, 10,000 books? From the crowd that we saw there and said Black XO pulls in like 80,000 people or whatever. Wow. So we now said, yeah, you know, all we need is like 10,000 of those people to spend $2 and we'll leave here with $20,000. I mean, that was the philosophy on that. So uh, the idea for the for Brother Man was, a, you know, it was a little character sketch that I had in my sketchbook, but it wasn't developed. So my brother Guy was living in Delaware at the time. And he said, you know, like I said, Guy's a writer. No brain. Yo, Guy, you gave him a call. Hey man, we think about making this comic book. Um, you want to meet up so we can uh, talk about it? He's like, yeah, all right. So he drove up to Jersey, and we had to sit down. And then that's when he said, okay, yeah, you know, we can have these main characters. There have to be the three main ca- these main characters, and they were kind of based on the the archetypes of your typical action story. You know, uh, the hero. We uh, Antonio Valor, who's brother man. Right, yeah, he's right there in the background for those of you who haven't seen Brother Man. You wanna kinda of move to the side so people can get a good look at him. And he's a lawyer. He said, let's make him a lawyer. And his coworker is Melody Rich. She's also a star in the book. But we didn't want her to be the, the uh, damsel that needs to be saved. We wanted her to be like, like she thinks for herself, she's just as high powered as him as a lawyer, you know. Um, they work together, but then Guy still created, he's really good at creating character personality traits to really make them distinctly different. So uh, Melody and Antonio, they were the first two, Antonio Valor and Melody Rich. And then uh, then Guy, Guy had a character named Duke Denham from a story that he made up in the 80s, but in the 80s he was like a detective frog. But then we said, hey, well, let's just take that character and turn him into the DA. So in Brother Man, he's actually, um, you know, he's a man, but he's he's an older man. Uh, he's real stocky. He's that dude that, you know, is just grumpy all the time. You know, like just, you know, he just seems so stressed out all the time. And he's their boss because he would kind of play off of those old 70s. You know, you know, the boss on the old 70s shows, whenever you watch them, they always you know, tie and always oh, unkept and like, they just seem like they <laughs> stressed out all the time. So that's what Duke was based on. But like I said, as the, as the story developed, all the characters refined and we moved away from the, the, the trope concept. And they, they evolved very quickly by the, really by the end of the first issue into the second issue, they became more refined. By issue number three, they were even more refined because then we started understanding our power that, yo, man, all the people are buying our book. Because by the first year, we, we went from 10,000 books to 40,000 books by the end of the year. Wow. Yeah, that's how many books we sold in a year. And by the second year, we had 150,000 books. Third year, we had half a million. That's how, that's how it was exponentially growing. A half a million. <laughs> and then, then when my mom died, we were at 750,000. So you figure if, if things were going and continuing, we did all those shows that year, we'd have been over a million. And then accelerated because we were building more connections with people, but then everything retracted and we pulled back. So some people thought Brother Man just stopped or, oh man, the man stopped Brother Man. I said, man, we are the man. I, don't, I never used that term, the man. I said, then he's the man, who are you? You're the boy? You know what I mean? I said, I, I don't use that term. I said, uh, Nobody, nobody stopped us. It, it was internal. It was something we had to do. Uh, we had to handle ourselves. And me and my brothers, you know, we were living our own lives anyway. You know, at that point, I was, I was married, uh, and I had uh, two sons, and well, I still have them. I'm talking about I had them. <laughs> They've grown up now. But uh, I have two sons, and Guy had his family. He moved out to San Diego, and now he's in Virginia. Uh, Jason's doing his thing. He lived in various places. He, I think he's back on the West West Coast now. <clears throat> and um, so for me, like bringing Brother Man back, it was something that I kind of had to spearhead over the years. So it, it was on hiatus for a long time. So I stopped doing Brother Man uh, after my mom, because when my mom died, now we're kind of caught up to that. 
And then a year later, my dad died. So my mom had, uh, uh, she had an aneurysm, and then my dad had lymphoma cancer. And that was a year apart from each other. So I was all messed up. I mean, we had the uh, Big City Comics World Headquarters in Philly that was opened up basically by money that my dad gave us from my mom's insurance. Uh, when she passed away, he basically said, your mom would want y'all to continue. I didn't really want to touch this money, but you guys need to um, get this store. So we opened up a store in our old neighborhood in Philly, and that was Big City Comics World Headquarters. We were teaching art classes to kids. And uh, man, we, had, we were doing a lot of stuff out of there. And that's why I drew Brother Man number 11. And I was doing that under duress because I was sad. You know what I'm saying? And then what happened was, then my dad died, and number 11 was sitting in a box for like a year. I didn't even put it out. So then when he died, we just shut the store down and everybody just disbanded, you know? And uh, so at that point, I knew what I was gonna do. And a friend of mine, he called me from New York and he said, hey man, I uh, got a job for you. And I was like, what? And remember, I tell you, I, said, I wasn't trying to get no jobs, you know, since I was a teenager. But I think this was a good time now to have a job. Got uh, uh, she, my, my ex-wife, she was pregnant with my second son. So I said, man, this is a good time to have a job. And it wasn't no corny job either. He said, yes, uh, would you be a character designer on uh, Pink Panther CD-ROM game? So shout out to Brian Gidry for that. And I was like, whoa, a character designer on Pink Panther? Like, who don't know Pink Panther? And he said, I said, but I was like, man, I never did that before. I never did character design. I never worked at a studio. You know, Brother Man was raw. I'm, I'm going straight from the streets to airbrushing shirts on the streets, to making a comic book based on how I just want to draw. You know, I don't have no boss. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not working around any other professionals who could show me how to do it. I'm just doing it based on, this is what I think you do. But now it's like, he's asked me to come to New York, the hub, and be a character designer on a game. And I didn't know anybody, you know, there's a lot of people and young people now working in these industries, but back then, it wasn't it wasn't that easy to get into a, a a black young black person to get into like working on an animated show or a game or something like that. It wasn't a, it wasn't a lot, or if it was, it was a small community, you know, because before internet and all that stuff. So <clears throat> I told him I said, "Hey man, what what I need to bring?" You know, I was like kind of nervous. He said, "Man, just bring your skills," and I was like, "He believes in me like that." I was like, "I because you know I didn't think I was that good." work on a Pink Panther game. And I was, I was intimidated. And then, um, <clears throat> so I went up there, uh, I, you know, since all my family from Jersey City, you know, I said, all right, let me get a place in Jersey. And I just took the PATH train or whatever, or a dollar across the river going to Manhattan and just started working my job. And they, and it, it was just really kicked back and fun. I met a lot of cool people. And I just, that's what started my professional career. Like, working around other professionals. And then that game company closed after a year. They, they shut down after a year. But I actually um, missed the, the name change, which actually happened right before I went to New York. <clears throat> uh, my, after my dad died, uh, no, actually it happened when I was in New York, I'm sorry. After my dad died, I remember uh, looking at a lot of his works. And one of the things he created was a uh, family tree <clears throat> that we used to have at our family reunions. And I just remember looking on the family tree and looking at the last name Sims. And I and and that's when I really started like reading more on our history. And since I, my dad's not here now for me to ask him questions, now I gotta be, you know, now I'm the now I'm the Baba. I'm the father of the family. I'm the one that the young people are gonna ask me for the information. So now I can't just be sitting around drawing all the time. I got to get my knowledge base up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I said, let me start reading some of these books. So I was riding the A train every day, you know, riding the A train. You got plenty of time to just think and read. So I was reading that. Now I had mad books. I was just running through and, and then I just started getting all this history and information. And then when I started looking at our family tree, it really started making me ask like, yo, who, who am I? Where am I from? I know, I know my ancestors did not come to this country as Sims. And in one of the naming books that I had, I had an African naming book that my father had. Actually, I had a, basically the books. 
when my dad passed away, I had his book collection. So I was going through it and I was looking at the naming book and my second son was just born. And I said, man, his name has to mean something. It has to, like the book said, your name portends your destiny. What you call yourself is what you become. So he had the first African name. I named him Omari. Omari Manu Faraji Anyabwile. And Omari means the highest. My new second born, Faraji, born at a time of grief. And <clears throat> Anya Bwile, God is unchanging. And I remember when uh, I was sitting down with my ex-wife, and you know, we all, you know, we was all sitting there uh, with my, my older son, he's five at the time. And I said, we need to change this fan. The last name is the legacy. And I said, even though I don't know, I'm not picking the name because of a region, because I don't know what region I'm from. But that doesn't matter. The thing is, I know that my ancestors descend from there. So I'm just going to use a name that I just choosing a name for, for a definition. You know, so when I saw Anya Buile, I said, yo, that's it. That's where I felt like I was at at the time. I started looking at health because I said, I did, if I had a headache, I'm thinking I'm going to have an aneurysm like my mom. And I said, I got to do something about that. So I started going to all these health and holistic conferences in the Bronx and uh, Harlem and stuff. And my eyes started opening up to like common sense type stuff. I read Dick Gregory's book, Cooking with Mother Nature, Queen of Fools book. That's all the stuff I was reading on the A train. And I said, this is just so dope. And I said, man, I'm changing my life. I'm going to give my children uh, uh, another way of looking at life. They're not going to grow up eating Twinkies and donuts and all that dumb stuff that, that we grew up on. And, um, and so, even so, Brother Man at this point is on a hiatus. I'm not thinking Brother Man anymore. For this, this not saying I, I didn't abandon it. It's this now became. Remember, I said how the airbrush was like that new door that opened. Right, right. This is another door that opened. The airbrush was one door. That was one portal. Making the comic book. Wow, let's make a comic book. Black Expo. Another portal. Parents die. Everything collapses. You think it's over, and then bam, you learn about. Uh, your culture, your history, and eating differently, boom, another portal opens. Like, oh, I got to learn all this stuff. That becomes priority over everything. So then those other things beforehand, they're not gone. You always, it's, it's like you pretty much mastered it, but now you gotta, now you got to master another element of self. So I remember uh, my ex-wife saying, like, do you think like Anya Bwile might be too complicated for people to say? I said, we're complicated people. Right on, right on. I said, you know what? I said, people learn how to say Mitsubishi. They learn how to say <laughs> Hyundai, the Fafik Nugan. You know what I'm saying? We learn how to say all these words. They're going to learn how to say Anya Buile. Anya Buile. You see what I'm saying? Like, we got to get out of that whole thing that once it comes from the continent and the motherland, oh, I can't say it. You ain't trying to say it. You know what I'm saying? That, that's how I felt. I said, they don't, they don't learn how to say it. And, and sure enough, I go to certain places and people read the name, uh, Dawood Anya Bwile. I'll be like, bam, you got it. Right on. <laughs> and then you got some people, uh, uh, oh, oh, I'm not even going to try to say this. I said, you're not even going to try to say it. Well, how ignorant is that sound? I'm not even going to try to say it. I said, you are a grown woman <laughs> talking about you ain't going to try to say it. I have had that experience. <laughs> I, I had one teacher in high school. Whenever she came to my name, and it was just Tamu, T-A-M-U, she would flat out refuse to even try to pronounce my name. <laughs> now, see, I see, that, um, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. So after a while, you just start realizing, like, this is that's, that's the comic book material. That's like the stuff that would be in Brother Man. You see what I'm saying? Because to me, Brother Man was... Like me and Guy kind of taking those types of elements and putting that into an action adventure, a mythology. And that's why people loved it. Because I see my aunt such and such. I see my uncle such and such. It wasn't making fun of them. It's a personality trait. Some people, I just ain't going to try to say it. Hey, <laughs> I know. That's a character. You don't let them try to say nothing. Right. So, oh, give, me that Mitsubishi. give me that, that Mitsubishi. <laughs> uh, so, how do you say that? Right, right, right. So, Dawood, speaking of the comic book and some of the elements, do you have any images that you could show us? Do a share screen? Funny you should ask. <laughs> I think that uh, would be nice. I have a lot of images here. 
Oh yeah. So uh, make sure to screen present to everyone. Okay. Um, now is this presenting to everyone? Like, I don't know if it is. Yeah, I do see it. And if there's a way that you could like open the screen, make the screen a little bit bigger, if possible, like the image a little bit bigger. Yeah. See, it's it's on my. Um, okay. No, that's not working. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's make not, it it's not moving. No, it, it made it so big that it cuts the image off. Oh, yeah, I, I'm yeah. doing that my, on my own. I'm, I'm just growing it up because okay. I'm working on my, uh, my, this is on my uh, drawing tablet. I have two monitors here. And where is my pen? Oh, man. Where's my pen at? Okay, well, it's not like I'm trying to draw anything right now. Okay, so um, let me show you a couple things. Is there anything in particular, uh, or just you want me to just open up whatever? Well, if in particular, if you have any, do you have any of the original images or any of the book covers from some of the original comic? Uh, oh, yeah. From the original books, and you know, before you get ready to talk about the, oh, the new stuff. Back. Oh, okay, let me uh, let me close that then. That's <laughs> yeah. All right, let me show you. Let me show you some of this, some of the classic stuff. Uh, drawn to greatness. Okay, what I'm gonna show you here, since I talked about the history, um, okay, since I talked about the history, I'm gonna show you some of the things I was talking about to give you an idea. All right, so basically, like I said, growing up in Philadelphia, and I'm just gonna run through this real quick. Can you see this? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's kind of like neighborhood that we grew up in, you know. Uh, is that a bus or a trolley? It's a trolley, that's the old school trolley. We used to ride wow. the 23 trolley. Um, <clears throat> that, that's my dad in the center. Uh, in the red shirt, that's my oldest brother, Mike. He's the one I told you passed away. Mm -hmm. That's me next to him. That's my brother, Jason. And that's my brother, Guy. And that fireplace, that's where I burned my comic books when I was a kid. Uh, that's a whole nother story. Okay. Uh, this is the first comic book I ever drew. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I still have it. It was, uh, this is in 1973. Wow. It's called The Protectors. The Protectors. That is awesome. And that is all. <clears throat> so there's your proof. Told you I, that's all I had to do is draw. You know. What a handsome young man. You can see I, I wasn't the athlete. Wasn't doing all that. That's, that wasn't my life. I was doing spaceships, superheroes, Marvel comics, all that stuff. That was my thing. Um, and that's uh, that's me and a friend of mine up the street and his little sister. All of us were sitting there reading comic books. That was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, that's my dad on the left, and that's my brother Guy, the writer of Brother Man. Oh wow. Um, so remember I was saying like in the basement, my dad had all these books. Oh yeah. And, uh, you know, books about Africa, uh, slavery. You know, this is the book I was telling you about, the movement that had the lynchings. And I would look at this stuff when I was little. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then um, what happened was, you know, I, I was collecting comics around that time. Like when I was from third grade to about fifth and sixth grade, I was, you know, I was a comic book fiend. Mm -hmm couldn't tell me nothing. All I cared about was comic books. And my dad, he wanted to sit down and talk to me about comic books. And he started breaking down the imagery of, first of all, there weren't many black characters and other black characters that were there. The majority were the uh, sidekicks or stereotypes. You know, that's, that's no new news to us. Right. To people in general. And so, you know, I was excited when my dad wanted to talk about comics because I just thought, you know, I just thought he wanted to get in on his action. I thought he wanted to get up on it. I thought I was going to teach him a little something. And next thing you know, he's breaking down the whole 
deal about the imagery of what you look at and what it represents. Right. So he said, I just want you to be aware. He didn't tell me what to do with it. He just said, be aware. But see, back then, I was saving all my lunch money so I could buy comic books, like little change here and little change there. So I basically starved myself during the day so I could buy comic books after school. And then when I realized, like, as a kid, this is kind of like a you know knee-jerk reaction for me as a kid, but I was a little revolutionary. I was like, man, I'm, I'm saving my, my lunch money for this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and so basically, my dad had the fireplace going one night. And this is all part of a presentation I do, so this is why this is in sync. So I'm kind of skipping through it just to follow up on where I was. I burned all my books. And I tell people now that burning my comics, what it did, it burned the grip that the industry had on my mind. Right on, right on. But what I learned from the comic books was just the foundation of storytelling. You see what I'm saying? So it's not like I hated comic books. I just hated that we were represented like that. Yes, yes. So then I, so then, that's when I got up on these um uh, Black history comics and things like that. And that's what led me to doing the things that I'm doing now. So there's a lot more I could say about that, but I'm going to jump into, uh, this is Brother Man number one. Oh, wow. This is the cover of the first book that came out in 1990. I like that. Brother Man is, he's here. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because when we, I always think about, I, it's just so clear to me when we came up with this, uh, my brother Guy came up with the cover concept and he said, you know, have a close up on his face yeah. and just have a B on his forehead and it'll say like brother man and then say put he's here and then, you know at the bottom put everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. I said, oh, that's so tight. That's so tight. That's and, <laughs> <laughs> that's become the moniker. I mean, there's there's dudes who told me I mean, I had grown men in tears. So mm. my brother man has changed their life, you know, because their life, their life stories was not like mine. You know, some dudes they 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 had dealt with gang activity. Some dudes they were just rejected growing up, basically invisible man. You know what I mean? And they saw Antonio Valla, the character that we created in Brother Man. They saw an icon. They saw somebody that they can aspire to be like. Right on. One brother told me, um, I think this, I think this was the brother, was this the brother in, no, 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 this he, this brother was at the uh, art show when we did a brother man art show. And he's talking about how he was into certain negativities. And then he, when he was reading brother man, he said, Antonio Valor represented all that was good. Mm. And he said, man, Antonio Valor would not approve of what I'm doing. Mm. I gotta stop this, and it, it almost like I kind of want to laugh, like not laugh at him, like laugh like Antonio Valor would not approve of this. Like this character, cartoon character, would not approve of what he's the ill stuff he's doing in real life. So he'll stop the ill stuff he's doing in real life because what this character that we made up is doing, and it's not a funny like laughing because it's funny. I'm kind of laughing because it's like. This is what we made it for, and now this is like a real um, testimonial that that works. Right on. You see what I'm saying? And that's why I said that all that was the stuff that was solidifying the superpower. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And wow. um, <laughs> and and also, I had another brother say he was a lawyer because Brother Man was a lawyer in the comic, so he became wow. a lawyer in real life. Wow. I mean, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How does that make you feel? I mean, that is, that's beautiful. Oh, it is. It's, it's overwhelming at times. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, there's, there's so many things, elements to this story that it's, it's overwhelming when I think about the reality of it. Like people coming up to me crying. I'm, I'm talking about grown men and they're saying, I'm not ashamed to let these tears flow because you changed my life and hugging me. Right on. You see what I'm saying? But to me, it's like, I'm thinking back to the 80s in the store and them dudes coming down. Remember I told you about the dude saying, that's corny, blah, 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 and he ended up being my boy. Cause he wasn't an evil person. He was just probably used to just confront, confrontation all the time. He right. confront, the other dude confront, somebody end up getting beat up, stabbed or shot. Right on. As opposed to, they're not used to loving each other, like getting a hug, man, or 
or like somebody saying, yo, I love you, man. Or yo, you're, you're good, man. You're dope. They're probably not used to that. So they got to fight to, to show people that I'm dope. Right on. You see what I'm saying? And I, I understood that. I mean, to me, that was nothing, no, no science to that as far as I was concerned. Oh, this Duke Denim I was telling you about. <laughs> right on. <laughs> you know, but we have a whole adventure on him now called The Cold Hard Cases of Duke Denim back when he was younger. <laughs> that, that series is so dope. Guy, Guy just came out with that two years ago, and there's already, I think, six installments. And those are books. Those are novels. They're not uh, comic books. Right. I love the hair. I love the hair. <laughs> we, call that, we call that a half row. Half of a half row. Half row. <laughs> yeah. And is that a bag of donuts? Yeah, chunky donuts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but yeah, he's kind of represent, you know, like he's he's caught up in the, the red tape bureaucracy, but he has a good heart. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's just caught up. You know, his health is not really good. And Antonio's always trying to get him on, on the health tip, you know. Uh, and I didn't really talk too much about Antonio Ballard himself because. Okay, let's, let's see really, more of him. Yeah, he is really like a. And it's funny, it's like I created a character uh, in the early 90s before I even understood anything about veganism and eating healthy, because back then I was eating whatever. But I just knew Antonio Valley, he wouldn't eat what I eat. So mm -hmm. I was creating somebody, I didn't really understand what he eat, but in all the comics, you never see him eat junk food. In the oh. meeting, he was eating a salad in Brother Man number two, and he had an apple, an apple and a grapefruit juice in number six. Mm. So really, he was like a raw foodist, but I, I didn't know. I, I knew he was something greater than me. But now I don't feel like he's greater than me. I feel like I understand him and we are all this great. Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's why understanding that now, bringing Brother Man back, where it's, it's like it's going into another level because now I'm claiming all that. Okay. So wait a minute. Okay, so you just said you're bringing Brother Man back. So the last Brother Man was in 1994. And so bring us up to when did you bring Brother Man back and what was the impetus to bringing Brother Man back? Okay. Um, well, here's where the original books, issue number one, issue number two. Okay. This, this is still the like early 90s issue. Brother number. Man, Dictator of Discipline. I love that cover. <laughs> yeah, issue number three, Block and the Twin Terrors. They were, they were like uh, Brother Man comic favorites. Uh -huh. uh, issue four, issue five. Wow. Um, I don't it's think like I had. Ice Cube right there. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, people see all kinds of people in the book, even though I just make characters up. Because there's just just seeing people that kind of represent realness. Okay, that's number seven. All right. Okay, so wait a minute. G can you give me a little background? Why is there an artist there? And so what's the yeah? This is um, from Brother Man. Okay, S issue six. Portrait seven, Inception. Yeah, eight and nine. Uh huh. This is a four part story in the original Brother Man comic series Excellent. about this artist named Donald Urbane. Oh. He a, he's basically like a self-serving artist <laughs> and he was and, and, and you know this was rooted in me thinking about art school and stuff like that and and also think about dudes that you knew coming up that like you know they were the players you know they they was pulling all the women you know all the women was going crazy for them so it was kind of like combining that attribute of that character with a masterful artist wow the artist also has a flaw his flaw is that he he he's not creative mm. he, he can only copy so he's a master at copying but he can't create a re like if you just give him a blank piece of paper he's at a loss but if he copies something you can't tell the original from his copy that's how masterful he is wow so portrait of deception was how he was he was basically stealing paintings from a museum copying the paintings and then putting his painting back into the museum mm. and keeping the original and selling that on the black market. And then he would get women that, he, that would fall for him. He would give them the painting and they would think it's a gift, but really what they were doing was they were, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, they were hiding the painting. They were an accomplice without knowing. 
Oh, wow. And, and like Mel Melody met him at an art show. That's why when you saw this image of Melody, like here, that's not her lawsuit clothes. This is the way she was dressed when she went to the Sprawling Towers, which is like the art, um, it's like the arts district in big city, Fountain Springs. And there's a place called the Sprawling Towers and there was an art show going there. And when she went there, that's where she met the brother, Donald Urbane. Donald. And, you know, he walked up to her, you know, you know, you know, dropped some lines on her. She said, okay, impressive, impressive. She didn't know he was a criminal. And that's what the whole issue was about. That's why it's called Portrait of Deception. Right on, right, well, right. She thought he was for real. Mm -hmm. So in book two, the second part is when we, the readers, find out that he's no good, but she doesn't know. So the cover is representing what he, he has to kidnap her because she finds out about his scam. So his thing is, I got to kidnap her and get rid of her. So then my, my scam is not foiled. Cause you see those things wrapped in the background. Those are the paintings that he, oh, okay. these are the paintings that he stole from the museum. <laughs> wow. So he, she awesome. thinks he's painting her. She uh -huh. thinks he's painting her, but he's painting his image of what he's going to do to her. Oh. You see what I'm saying? But that, that's just symbolism. It didn't actually happen in the book like that. That was symbolism for the cover that guy came up with. And I used a doorknob to draw this and my mom actually sat in that chair for the positioning. Oh, so that's that, beautiful. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. There's, there's a story behind all of this. And, and it's multi-layered too, because these guys were in on the thing, Scribble and Scrabble's art supply shop. Did you say Scribble and, now are the, these two characters, they're Scribble and Scrabble? Yeah, Artemis Scribble and Scrabble Monroe. <laughs> They own, they own a um, they own a art supply shop. Oh wow! And that's what they do. They're the ones that actually hide the paintings because they have this um, special adhesive. <laughs> and uh, so Donald Urbane pays them to hide the original paintings and put a fake painting on top, like a clown painting or a dog puppy painting. But underneath, it could be like you know this great painting, but. <clears throat> they don't take the puppy painting and maybe give it to Melody so she'll hang it up in the house until the heat is off. But she doesn't know. She just thinks she has a painting in her house. She doesn't realize it's a multi-million dollar piece in her house. You see what I'm saying? So they, that's why people say they like Brother Man because the stories were unpredictable. They weren't hood stories, but people can identify with it as city stories. You see what I'm saying? But they were seeing these black characters doing things that were genius. <laughs> Even though he was a villain, he was still genius. He was still masterful. He was right. still eclectic. Okay. And, you know what I mean? And and the way Guy had him speak, he spoke very lofty. He had a very high vocabulary. But he was a criminal because when he was in high school, his teacher, his art teacher told him he's good at copying, but said, you have no imagination. And he got pissed off and said, well, forget high, high school. If I can't, I mean, forget art school. If I can't make, if I can't make money off of my own talent, I'll make money off of other people's talent. So that was his drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so that was like the early stories. I mean, yeah, all the stories were different and they're multi-layered. That's why I can't really break them down very. Right. Yeah, that's no problem. But it's, it's really nice seeing the covers. Yeah, and it's funny, like when I look back, I see all the flaws. Because remember I said, <laughs> when I did this, I was just going in rough. I didn't have any um, professional experience. And I was just drawing straight street level. But it's nice, it's nice, it's beautiful. Yeah, so issue number 10 started the origin story. So that's Antonio Valor when he was little, and that's his dad, Leonard Valor, and that's his mom, Carmen Valor. And she was pregnant with little T, his Aww. little T. And this man right here, that's Emmett Fourflusher. <laughs> Four that's yeah, that's his dad's adversary, and he was running for mayor, but he's like the crooked politician. <laughs> and and then issue number 11, this is the one I said, I uh, uh, sat in a box for a year. Mm. This is the one, the day this came out, my mom died. Mm -hmm. the day this one came out, this came out after my dad died and I used my money from my job in New York just to print a few of them and I said, I'm done. Yeah. At least for them. So this was the last one that came out. This was in 95. Mm -hmm. So fan, Brother Man fans, and this ended on a cliffhanger. We just, Still telling the, the, the part about Brother Man when he's a teenager, when he first, Antonio Valor first decided to become this hero. And these are his friends. That's Antonio in the middle, and there's friends next to him. Right. And 
it was 20 years, I believe, before the graphic novel came out now, which is showing, um, which picks up where this story left off. So right. We waited 20 years to find out what happened next. Right, and Dawood, okay, so it was 20 years, and you started working on the graphic novel for Brother Man, but wasn't there, I think I remember a couple of years ago, you told me, and I don't know if you're at liberty to talk about it, but wasn't there a book, another book, graphic novel, so for someone oh, else that you were working Monster. With? Yeah, Monster that we did for Walter Dean Myers. Oh, okay, Monster. Yeah, and... Um, you have an image for that book? And I think I, I do remember one of my sons when they were in high school, they read that book. Yeah, that book is, that book is huge. That book has been um, a part of school district since 1999, and me and Guy were hired to do the adaptation mm -hmm. a novel, and that came out in the end of 2015. And right. that, that book is in schools all over the place. Right. Um, do you have an image of that one that you can show? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm pulling it right here. Yeah, because I think I remember you were almost finished with it. You would work on it. You would work your day job and then work on that in the evening. Do I have? Do I remember that correctly? Yeah, yeah. I, I work. I would work all day long, and then. Um, uh, come home and then work on Monster till like three or four in the morning. And I was doing that for like nine months straight till this book was done. Right, yeah. And I used to say, make sure you get some sleep. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. That, that was back in the day. Everybody was trying to tell me that. I said, man, I, I can't sleep till this book is done. But this is what the inside looked like. It was in black and white. Truth? What is truth? Anybody in here know what truth is? Truth is truth. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, so this this is uh yeah, and 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 Walter D. Myers passed away the day I finished the book. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that that was kinda So he never got to see what did he ever I, get I never got I, I never I never got to meet him. I mean I, I wow. spoke I, I communicated with him via internet mm -hmm. with the book publisher and I was looking forward to touring with him. Yeah. Um, but he, he died, and, and it was sad because I felt like all those months I was working on it, I felt like I was working, I was getting to know him like family. Wow. So you have so many beautiful stories, though. So many. I'm. I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join. There we go. Yes, I know. Cree Summers played her. Yeah, Cree Summers did her voice. And this is the drawing. This is a drawing I did for the show. These are actual from Rugrats. Yeah, this is actual art from the show because I, I used to keep a lot of my drawings from the show. Now, was so that after I was in New York, I had moved to LA, uh -huh. and then I ended up. Well, actually, when I was in New York, I worked on this show too, Daria. Oh, oh, you worked on Daria as well. Um, I, after I Pink Panther, then I ended up on Daria. So Rugrats. Daria. Uh, Wild Thornberries. There we go. Wow, I love I love that show so much. I think I loved it more than my kids did. <laughs> and yeah, that's that's pretty fun. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Oh so, yeah. The yeah, um, uh, Wild Thornberries. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Tommy. I think yeah. That's Tommy. Uh, and, uh, let me see. Then I ended up at Turner Studios and doing stuff for Cartoon Network. <laughs> You're like 15 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a big sign outside the uh, studio. I thought I saw that was funny. Uh, oh, here's my parents. Oh, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I think that's about a year. Uh, that's probably a year before my mom passed. Mm. Well, I think that's the year she did pass. Yeah. I mean, he passed the uh, following year. I know uh, your parents, uh, they, they must be so proud of you. Oh, yeah. I, already, I already know it. You know, every time we do a Brother Man art show, whatever, I always have libation pouring oh. for the show because we did we did seven Brother Man art exhibitions since 2009. I always opened it up with libation pouring, right and honoring the ancestors, and for it to now be in the Smithsonian, I feel like that I because you know, like I said, during that downtime when I was working with the studios and stuff. 
Mm -hmm. It was still painful. I was feeling like a lot of pain during that time. Because, right. you know, when my brother died in 2010, you know, even with Walter Dean Myers dying, I just felt like, man, why is it every time I work on something, somebody's dying? You know, that's how I was feeling. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, not to say, like, I look at it differently now because you can look at it one way, everybody's dying in a gloom situation, or you can look at it as each person that passes, they are now, um, their energy is now uh, eternal. Yes, yes. And now you're feeding off of their eternal energy. Yes. Because if my parents didn't pass away, I probably wouldn't have became vegan. Not to say, like, I'm glad or not. I'm just saying what you take from it can transcend into beautiful things. Right on. Depending right on how you look at it. And me, it just made me start to study this journey. Like, why did my mom and dad die? And then I said, you know what? I got to eat better. I got to take better care of my health. And right on. You know, and that's helped me now. Like, you know, I'll be 53 in February. I haven't been sick in 22 years. Yeah. And, you know, I just wanted to reiterate for those who have entered, you know, the video, the live video late and uh, those who are just come onto the chat room. I just wanted to reiterate what I read at the beginning. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I shared a press release. It, uh, for immediate release, January 3rd, 2018, Brother Man Comics included in Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Uh, check out the Smithsonian and see all the wonderful art there. Okay, so go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I thought I probably showed uh, this. Um... Is this the press release? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so is that the same yeah. thing? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that, that's pretty hype. So, I mean, that's why there's so much detail to this. That's why I always feel like I'm bouncing around or am I talking mm -hmm. too much because there's so much to say. But the graphic novel, uh, which which we finally came out with, and you know what? Let me, let me unscreen it. I'm going to I'm going to unscreen here for a second. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show you a little sign. Okay. All right. Uh whoop, whoop, unscreen. Unscreen go. Oh. Okay. Cool. All right. Here is the graphic now. This is what it looks like. There we go. I'm going to hold it up a little bit more when you get a chance, I guess. I don't mean to rush you. <laughs> so. no, okay. So this came out at the end of, no, January 2016. It won two book awards. Wow. Uh, Story of the Year and Best Artist. Mm -hmm. And so this was done uh, by myself doing the drawings. Uh, my brother did the writing. And my good friend Brian McGee did the color work. Mm -hmm. actually, me and Brian met at Cartoon Network. Uh-huh. Yeah. Back in the early 2000s, I remember when I first met him. I said, "Man, this dude is incredible." Is that when you were working on the Wild Thornberries, or um... I, I, I left? I left Wild Thornberries in '99, and I got to Atlanta in 2000. Mm -hmm. When I got to Atlanta, that's when I started working at Cartoon Network, and then that's when I met Brian McGee, and and he said he was a fan of Brother Man, like when we met, and he's from New York. And he used to work at Disney. I mean, he worked on major stuff at Disney. You know, a lot of, a lot of those Mickey Mouse images you see, they look airbrushed and stuff. Right. A lot of those are his. A lot of those are his drawings. Right, Brian McKean. That's how dope he is. Yeah, he does stuff for uh, Walking Dead. Uh, I mean, he worked on Netflix movies and stuff like that. And me and him, we, you know, we work close together. Um, you know, he's also a musician, so, you know, he helps me with uh, conceptualizing music for Brother Man and Mm -hmm. You know, we're basically building the team. That's what we're trying to do here in Atlanta is build our own production studio, like high quality productions. So I'm going to share your website again in the chat room for the newcomers to see it. Check out what is that? Brothermancomics.com. Right. Uh huh. So okay. this particular book has been getting a lot of great reviews. Mm hmm. And the thing about it is, when I was showing you Brother Man number 10 and 11, you know, the origin story, mm -hmm. 
you know, it's, it, this book basically is about young Antonio Valor before he became Brother Man, because I don't know if you noticed, this is young Antonio, and he's casting a shadow. Oh. He's casting a shadow, there's a man in the shadow. Yeah, yeah. Because some people, they didn't catch that. So that that's the foresh- what is he called? Uh, foreshadowing. Yeah, foreshadowing. Yeah. Yeah, of, of who he's to become. Oh, yeah, I see it now, because the hair looks shorter in the shadow, it's not the fro. And his right. Arms are yeah, he, yeah, his style changes in the future. But he, yeah, he's bigger, he's more ripped, you know. But this is about his journey. In Revelation, this deals more about his mom and his dad mm-hmm. and how his mom and dad met. Um, this deals with the family dynamic. Um, all those things that I was telling you about in our family, we put a lot of that in the book. Pain that I went through ended up in this book. That's why a lot of people said this book was pretty emotional for them mm-hmm. because this deals with uh, Antonio's father, Leonard Ballard, and how him and his mom met. And Leonard Ballard was, you know, he grew up hard and basically an abandoned child. And Carmen, she was a fashion designer. And so we basically used my mom and dad as the archetypes because my mom at one point, she said she wanted to be a fashion designer, but it never manifested. So I said, okay, Carmen, she's a, she's a fashion designer. Wow. And, um, and, and basically it's talking about how, basically it, how he rose up from running the streets to becoming this community activist, this community leader and family man. And so this book is basically like the father's story uh, coming into knowledge of self. Think of, think of like, think of like Malcolm X in mythology. Right. You know what I mean? Like we have so many stories. We have so many stories like that in our community. And they always, when some people say like, what, what made you come up with brother man? It's, it, it does come down to that. It was like, there's a lot of stories in our community that go to the grave unknown. Right. And we have to, instead of always like, I mean, I, I like anime, you know, I appreciate it, I respect it and all that. But at a certain point, we got to create our own genre. We have stories to tell. Other people are telling their stories. They're manifesting their ideas. They're manifesting their visions. You know what I mean? Right. So for me, I try to encourage like the young kids, tell your stories. Who, who, who are your grandparents? Who are your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your own story? And take that and create archetypes out of that, create adventures and all that. And then what it is, you're giving the world another perspective, another worldview of who we are. And, and I call that drawing from the soul. And that's what we use for this book. You know, that's why it resonates a lot with so many people because they they feel it. You know what I mean? And, and that's why I said, you know, I can go on and on a lot of that, but you know, I guess I'll have to let people uh breathe. I don't want to <laughs> smother them with all this information. No, you're you're doing great. This has just been beautiful. So uh let's see. So you decided to get a comeback to brother man. I'm not sure if I caught where like what happened that all of a sudden you're like, you know what, we're going to bring brother man back. Did you cover that? I'm not sure. Well, I mean, that was, that was, like I said, when I met Brian McGee at Turner. Right. Yeah. He yeah. said, I'll help you bring it back. Right. right. And your awesome. brother, did your brother help on that as well? Well, guy, he's a, guy's always like, I mean, guy, his, Guy's been working in the college system for for years. He he right. has a PhD. Right, right. You don't realize he's Doctor Guy Sims. <laughs> he, got, he got a PhD. You know he he's among the professors and and he's in the college. I mean he basically he's living his career. Right, right. He's like, if you need some writing, I'll write for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But really, I'm doing like the leg work. And bringing it back to life, which is cool, because that's what I that's what I do. And guys on board when I need them, and I try not to ask him for too much more because he's doing his thing with his family. This is kind of like we're, we're I understand we're a team. Yes. Yeah. What I'm playing, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll set everything up, guy. You send me the script, and then I'll build it out from there. There you go. Yeah. So when I met Brian, that was instrumental because Brian was 
I'll, he's like, basically, I'll be one of the foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. I'll help you build this thing. I'll help you bring this thing back. And we would meet at lunch every day at, at, at Cartoon Network and just, he said, man, whatever you have, just like I'm telling you this stuff tonight, I was pouring so much stuff on him, but he wanted to know. He said, give me more, give me more. Do you have any music on this? I said, yeah, man, we got tons of music, beats and all that stuff that we made from the Brother Man series. He wanted to hear it all. So we would sit back, listen to the music, and he just absorbed the universe. He absorbed the world. Yeah. You know, and like, like in the, the book, we have our own subway map. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> he understood the whole concept of us creating this world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Brian McGee right there. The bottom. Oh. That's my brother Guy in the middle. Uh -huh. You know, uh, uh, we created our own currency. Oh, yeah. It's a world that we created. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so he understood what it is I was trying to do. And there was a couple other friends of mine, uh, a friend Maurice, he came in for a while, but he was very valuable at that moment to help me get things jump started. He was a, a graphic designer. And a couple other people on the team, and and that's when we did the first Brother Man art show. And the purpose of the art show was to tell the world Brother Man is coming back He's and putting back. the artwork on display. Putting the artwork on display led up to it being in the Smithsonian. You see what right. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Almost like if I didn't run into Brian to help me, I don't know if I'd have been on that path to bring Brother Man back. Because even Brian said, "This is a lot of work." Right, yeah. takes a village. <laughs> said, now I see. Now I see why you be overwhelmed. I said, "You see what I'm saying, man? This is a lot of work, and people be thinking you just put the stuff out there, and we're not funded. Right, right. We're making this stuff happen because we just believe in it, and we're sacrificing. Right. Nobody's so, how many books did you print? Hmm? Right. So, how many uh, books did you print for your first release of Brother Man's Back? Well, the first one. Now we only have a couple thousand. We didn't run ten thousand like back in the day. Um, we're in a different, this is in a, di we're in a different space now mm -hmm. and trying to get distribution is different now, you know, cause I'm not, I'm not in the car driving all over the country like we did when we were younger and the, the, uh, really what this book needs, it needs, uh, direct dis distribution now, you know, like, uh, because it's getting great reviews mm -hmm. and we do have it in certain venues but it's really not proliferated yet because a lot of people still don't know about it yet. And which is why we're building on it. I think now even being in Smithsonian is going to help it. You see what I'm saying? Right. And all these little steps we were working on, but I have a feeling there's going to be a point where, you know, it might be going like this and all of a sudden it goes like that. Right. And you do have the book available on your website to purchase. Exactly. Correct? Oh yeah. We sell them through the website all the time. Okay. So let yeah. me know that. Constant. Right. That is the website is www.brothermancomics.com, and there's a link that says store, and you can get a copy of that book as well as get a signed copy. It's also on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. Okay. On Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com. It's at Comicsology, C-O-M-I-X-O-L-O-G-Y.com, which is a um division of amazon but if you just want to have a digital book you can just download it off the app on your phone and read it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so, so yeah. we have the platform set up we just now we just need to more marketing and more distribution more sales team you know we're just doing what we can as us like a lot of people always thought our team was bigger thought we all always thought we had more than what we had and i you know i always project it because i said we're going to have that it's coming yeah, and also see on the website Brother Man Trade Paperback Volume One, and so that's like four, four yeah, of the. Are, yeah, th you can buy the original books in a compilation. Like the wow, that's awesome. That is awesome. Wow, oh my goodness! So that 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 was amazing, Dawood. I really enjoyed that journey. So, what is in? Okay, two questions. First, what is in Brother Man Comics' future? Is there going to be a next book, or you're waiting for this book to take off, or what's going on there? Well, uh, this book is book one of a trilogy. Oh, wow. Basically, there's going to be three of these. And once the three of these are done, that's it for the origin story. And basically, I could say 
all right, I'm, I'm straight with Brother Man as far as me having to feel like I got a complete post because now I finally finished this story. Because basically, this is like, you know, we already, have, we already have the script, we already had the whole book roughed out, but we had to break it into three stories because it's so thick. Right, but, right. What we did was we created like a movie. That's why a lot of people say this, this reads like a movie, you say, because we designed it like a movie. Right, right. So imagine like you're watching Superman and you know, you just read the part about young Clark Kent before he moved to Metropolis. You see what I'm saying? You know how like, yes, yes. First, that's just the first third of the movie. That's what this is. It's just the yeah. first third of the movie. This is just right. as a young kid before he even got to the second stage of master training and all that other stuff. That All that is coming later. We, I mean, we get into the whole spirituality, the whole concept of how Antonio Ballard went from the regular... You know, I'm not saying like street kid, but just mm -hmm. going from the kid to um, mastering self because right. this whole journey that took him, like his father could only take him, but so far, then the, the next level of instruction takes him into a whole nother spiritual realm. So right. we go basically from the dad being um, dealing with the gangs, uh, finding his self, his purpose, mm -hmm. uh, raising his family, and then his son coming up, having love in the family, the family being under attack by the political system, the son falling in terms of uh, losing, losing uh, hope, and then rising back up to greatness, and then becoming the hero. Wow. So that's what this, this journey is. But there's so much. I see. I can say that because there's so much to it. Where even if I say that, it's not even giving away the story because of how it's going to be told. Right on. Right and outside, on. Of, outside of the book, you know, we're we're still working on like film production, animation. You know, my older son, he he's actually a director, and he does. Um, oh yeah, right. I remember he was going to film school. Yeah, he does film compositing. Uh -huh. uh, Pinewood Studios here in Atlanta. That's that's the huge studio. Okay. He, um and um and not just him, I mean a lot of people around me are doing a lot of great things. Mm -hmm. You know, really it's just all about uh pulling all the pieces together and you know our our team is growing. And like I said, now with the things going on with not just Smithsonian, we have a partnership with Emory. Oh so you can go to big city map, big city map dot com. And you can see what we're doing in the virtual reality space with the universe of Brother Man at Big City. And we're doing oh, it. You said Big City Map. Oh, Big wow. MAP.com. And you can go there right now and see all the drawings that I did on there. Brian did the colors. Brian McGee did the colors. And we're busting that out with uh, Emory University. And that, that, that's unparalleled. What we're doing. <laughs> all right on. Every brother man's here, everything's gonna be all right. And you see the top, the menu at the top. You see where uh -huh. it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna share that right quick. Hold on one second, let okay. me get on over there and I'm gonna share that. Present to everyone. Oh, well, let me get to it. There, oh, we go. okay, cool. I can tell you. Um, see at the top where it says the city, uh huh. Click on that right here, okay. all at the top in the middle. Says the city. Oh, okay. I want to show you something. Am I doing that or is that you? No, no, that's that's a screen recording of me painting real time. Oh, oh. No, you got you got to scroll up to the top. Okay. The city. You see what it says? It says the project, the city, the process, the team. Okay. So which one? Oh, the city right there. Right, click on that. Okay, right there. Okay. All now right. scroll down and on the left, choose one of those backgrounds. Oh, actually, you know, choose the background at the bottom. Scribble and Scrabble Art Supply Shop. Because you, you, I just told you about Scribble and Scrabble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now after this loads, hit that uh, full screen in the lower right. Okay. All right. And I'm going to show you something. Okay, waiting for it to load. Hopefully my computer is set up for that. All right, so hit it now. Yeah. Oh my, oh my goodness. <laughs> I feel a little queasy. <laughs> All 
All right, do you see it? Yeah, just, are you scrolling around? You can, uh -huh. look, can you see I'm scrolling around? Yeah, you can look around the neighborhood. Oh, my Yeah, see, a lot of people don't even know about this yet. Well, a lot of this, we're, we're still getting it out there. It, all this is really relatively new. We're, we're creating out the whole, we're creating out the universe of brother man. <gasps> Neighborhoods are all different, so they all look like this. It's just like going from Brooklyn to the Bronx, Manhattan, you know, neighborhoods change. It's like Google Maps. <laughs> exactly. The, the map is on there, too. I, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll be having a four-hour interview if I was going to show you everything. Oh, this is Scribble Scribble and Scrabble's Art Supply Shop. Artemis yes. Scribble and Scrabble Monroe. That's directly from the book. Uh-huh. And little pieces of paper on the on the ground and DJ View, Bex Comics and Games, the Braid Boutique. <laughs> that, that, that was actually a play. Remember, I said uh, my cousin had the weed shop. Oh and, right, that's your cousin's uh, weed shop. That, that was kind of play off of that. Right, right. We just coming straight up at the. Uh huh. That is awesome. Okay. All right. Then, now let's see. How do I get out of this screen? <laughs> uh, I think you just go back in your browser. Okay. Let's see. I want you to. Uh... All right. Uh, escape. Okay. All right. That was an experience. Okay. Yeah. So and there's two more. There's a uh, Antonio Valles neighborhood right above that. Okay. And, um, 50, 550th Street? 550th Street, because Big City oh. is huge. And you have this for mobile? As yeah. Well. Desktop. Was, yeah, desktop, you want to hit that one. But you can look at it on your phone, too. OK. Yeah, well, I was working on this all last year. Um, I was working on this same time I was working on a, a project for Huffington Mifflin mm -hmm. and doing um, storyboards for a couple of television shows and movies. Right, because you're doing freelancing now, right? Consultant work, freelancing. Yeah, actually, I just did, um, you know, the movie Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Okay, cool. I did, yeah, I did the storyboards to the new movie, The Long Haul, that just came out. Wait that. a minute, is that sound that I hear? Yeah, with the, this one we did an experiment. <gasps> and I hear on. birds. I yeah, hear like the train in the background and birds. Yeah, that's Brother Man's house right there. That right uh, house there? right on the corner. Here or this one? The, the tan house on the corner. Okay. That's straight from the comic book. All the adventure takes place there. Oh, wow. But if you notice in his neighborhood, see how the trees, they look like baobab trees? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, people may not catch right away, but it's like a surreal universe. It's almost like mixing America with Africa, like oh, Africa wow. America. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. I'm creating my own environment based on the environments that I'm familiar with, but at the same time, creating a whole new world. Because all the neighborhoods, notice how this looks different than Scribble's Gravel's neighborhood? Right, yes. Yeah, all the neighborhoods are different. I love that tree. Thanks, and then and Antonio, he, he carved his name in the tree. You can see it. Let's see. It says Tone. Let's see, I see Anne, Mont. Mont, Mont, Tone. And Kev, because those, yeah, those are the three characters in uh, Brother Man, um, uh, Stepping Stones comic. Uh huh. Wow. So things like that. So let's see if I can. All right, let me go. Let me go check out one more neighborhood. So this one's entry into Totty Yard Industries. Tot Yard, yeah. Tot Yard. Tot Yard. And that, that taught yard is from um, the graphic novel. Remember when I said his father was in the gang? Mm -hmm. This is where they, they would hang out. They hang out at 456th Street. And that's the Strong Arm Expressway that you're going to be under. Okay. So they actually get into a, a fight in the comic under the Strong Arm Expressway. Wow. All right. Whoa. So this is where, like, the abandoned um, industrial park is. Oh, wow. This is apps. Oh, is it the L train platform? L, the no, platform. That's, that's the Strong Arm Expressway. It's a highway. Oh, okay. oh it's right, the, right. It's the hugest highway in big city, stretches from one end to the other, and it displaced a lot of people in the city. It's, oh. very, it's a very aggressive structure. Abandoned. 
Wow. Let's just say taught your uh, industries. Mm -hmm. Now, when someone's on their mobile phone, this works just like 360, it right? It works just as smooth. Wow, very cool. Wow, oh, this is amazing. Thanks. So yeah, so that, and you know, there, there's more. I mean, the, the, the subway map is on this website. You can click on, you can click on the subway map and see where that is in the city, like Google Maps. Uh-huh. If you explore that site, you're going to find more stuff. And we're adding, we're going to be adding more things to it. Oh, all right. Let's see. Let me get out of there. Okay. So there seems to be a lot in the world of Brother Man <laughs> that's coming up. So now it's next to you. So what is next for you? We have a question from one of the people in the chat room. And oh, nice. uh, it's from Chris Monet. And she wants to know, are you going to write an autobiography? I'm working on it now. I'm, it, uh, I started working on I think I did like 16 pages in. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I might have to I might have to reference this video and go back uh, and put some things in perspective because um, when I start writing, so many things happen. I try to figure out how to piece it all together. Uh -huh. um, I sometimes wonder, is like, should I put this in? Should I leave this out? Um, but the bottom line, I do want to write a book. I was thinking to title it "Drawing from the Soul" or "Drawn to Greatness," wow. and I want it to be a. I want it to be both a biography and art book. Mm -hmm. Like the way I was showing you, like my drawings from like little kid to you know doing these backgrounds and stuff for Emory. So uh -huh. you can see the journey because sometimes you know like some artists who do work that's that's really you know they're really great, but they only show you the really great stuff. Almost like you never had like you never had like work that looked like you were struggling or <laughs> you were always good. So sometimes I feel like it's almost a disservice. Well, I guess to a person like me, because I want to see the vulnerability aspect. Like, oh, okay, I see the journey. Mm -hmm. you know, some people, they only want to show you all their best stuff. So um, so in this book, I, I try to be a little bit more transparent. That's why I was saying, you know, the whole thing, at least opening it up to the to your people about, you know, this growing up, I, I wasn't like the, the yeah, I, I'll, I'll Reiterate, I wasn't an athlete and all that. You know, sometimes some dudes they feel like they they feel like they gotta be all rah rah, you know, to protect their manhood or something like that. And I think what does help some dudes sometimes realizing, and I'm just talking particularly to men being a man. It's right. like, you know, being a man, it's like, not like everybody throughout time was not um, playing basketball or whatever. You know, it's, it's cool for some people. Some people that's not their thing. But what's important is you doing what it is that you do. And right. what you do and loving yourself. So, and to answer that question, I say yeah because I think there's a lot of information I want to share and put out there that I think would be good for yeah. people of all ages. And Chris Monet says, don't leave anything out, please. <laughs> don't leave anything out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to leave some stuff. I can't put in all the details. I was, putting, I was putting the highlights. <laughs> so it was our mutual friend, Salima, that uh, introduced us. And um, I'm going to see if I can find that video <laughs> that she sent me. I want to. Well, my son shot that too. Huh? My son shot that. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw, yes. <laughs> I like that video. You were making um, uh, some kind of pesto with avocado. Avocado pesto pasta. And I was, like, I was nervous. I'm not I don't like being on camera doing stuff. I'm a I'm a uh what do you call it private. I mean I, I go on because I gotta do it and I was <laughs> but I wouldn't people say you should do a cooking show. I said, man, I would like to you, but that's not my personality. 
Yeah, I told you that when we first talked. I said, I like that video. You're a natural. You should do a cooking show. Nah, because if you do a cooking show, you got to be like animated. You got to be like, yeah, then you, you jump up. So, so. Yeah, I don't do all this. <laughs> You're just you. Yeah, just That's you awesome. Like, yeah. So, wow. This yeah. has been absolutely amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dawood. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So is there, are there any parting words that you would like to convey both to our folks in live chat and those who who will watch this in the replay? What would you like to leave with us? Well, the thing I always like to um, emphasize is um, doing, Whatever it is that you want to do, um, and I don't want to sound cliche, just go out and do it, because I think there's a little bit more to why sometimes we don't do the things we do, and sometimes it's because we may not have love for ourselves. Right on. We may not trust ourselves. You know, sometimes we think, uh, you know, like somebody might be watching this video and be like, oh, man, he's good. You know, like I'm outside of them. Like what he's doing is outside of me. You know what I mean? When I'm doing what I do. So what, it, what you have to do is love yourself and find out who you are and then kind of like forget the world, forget what the world is doing and do what you're doing and consistently do what you're doing. And then what happens is like I was telling you in my journey, I thought I was just that kid that was drawing. I didn't think I was any, anything super powered about me. And then one day it clicked. I got superpowers. And I got superpowers. And it was bigger than my pencil. It was yeah. all the things that made me who I am. That's what holistic is. Holistic yeah. art, all the stuff you see with artwork, artwork, that's just a tool. And this is just where I am right now. I might be in Africa one day wood carving. I might be somewhere else just doing something that has nothing to do with art. I may I may one day be doing food and health training and incorporating artistic ways to it. It's like don't put yourself in a box where uh, uh, you you just do this or you don't think you have the ability to do something. It's like just just um, just get out there and do whatever it is you want to do. Separate yourself from negative people. I think a lot of people uh, understand that now. I, I guess older people, younger people, you got to kind of let them know because, you know, hang on the wrong people get you in the Put you in the wrong situation, bad situation. But uh, but that's the main thing. I have to say, draw from the soul. You know, um, don't get lost in like people's posts. Oh man, this person they're traveling the world, and I'm still sitting in my room. This person, look at it, they're working on their next book, and I didn't even get my book out. Because what happened is, I think the thing with social media, it can it can kind of destroy that that fire that you had. Snuff out that fire that you had because you're getting caught up in everybody's moves and everybody's um, perspective of the world. Right on. And sometimes you have to like block that out because you have a fire and you and you got to cultivate that fire. You got to keep throwing wood on it, and, you know. And 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 it's going to get better. It's going to get better as long as you you put that energy in towards it. Mm -hmm. So I'll go on and on about that, but that's pretty much it. Right on. Okay, so again, I want to thank you. And uh, from the chat room, Chris Monet says, thank you for sharing your gifts with us, Dawood. And I'm sure she speaks for everyone in the chat room. And uh, this has been Tamu and Gina, Priestess of Self, with our amazing guest, Dawood Anyabwele. Did I get it right this time? Hey, it, it, it's sounding better and better every time. <laughs> Anya Buele. And uh, again, I want to thank you so much for being here. I invite everyone to please like the video, please thumbs up, please share the video on your social media, and please don't forget to subscribe to uh, find out and you know see more amazing interviews and conversations, although I don't know how I'm going to top this one. And uh, check out uh, Dawood's website, which is Brother Man comics.com and also the other site is anyabuele.com as well and i uh, just want to go ahead and take a moment we're going to release us from this uh 
sacred circle. I always like to take a moment to, um, I mean, I'm going to transfer the screen. I always like to take a moment to um, take a nice deep breath and remember the ancestors and all those who have transitioned before us. I wish you peace and great bliss.